Hi, I'm Jason Estry with Oliver Travel Trailers, and today we're going to take a look at the brand new 2024 Legacy Elite 2. Here at the front of the camper, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the LP housing. This is where the standard 20 pound tanks are located. Uh, you've got the lid on top and two latches, one on each side, as well as a quick access port in the front. Let's go ahead and take this cover off and take a look inside. Here inside the LP housing, we have the standard 20 pound tanks uh, with a two stage regulator. Uh, now this is an auto changeover regulator, so you've got both tanks hooked up. Uh, you can turn both tanks on and simply select the first tank you would like to pull from. As it pulls from one tank, you'll notice that it displays green. Uh, if gas is in the line and, and your tank has gas in it. Uh, once this tank depletes, it would automatically switch over to this tank, and as long as it is open, it would go ahead and start to pull the gas. Now, the gauge would start to show red since it's pointed to this tank. Uh, if you want to make sure to see the green, you would just simply push this over. This piece here will not move. Uh, it's something inside that automatically changes over from one tank to the other. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and take a look at how to remove the tanks. When they go empty and you have to get them refilled, you will have to remove them from the camper. You will want to make sure that both tanks are turned off. Once you do that, you would simply disconnect the regulator pigtails from the tanks. There's a wing nut located on top that's securing it on. You'll just turn this left to loosen it. All right. You'll lift the regulator assembly up and off. Move the little bar. And then you would just grab a hold of the tanks and lift them straight up and out of the camper. Here inside the housing, you'll notice the tank tray. Now, since we've got our tanks filled, we're ready to go back in. We'll just simply lift the tank up and over and make sure that we position it inside the tray. Go ahead and put the hold down bar in place. You'll put the regulator back on and then secure your wing nut. All right, then we'll go ahead and reattach the pigtails. And now we can go ahead and turn the gas back on. We're gonna go ahead and secure the LP lid back on. We'll wanna make sure that we do get the back of the lid secure on the bracket and then latch the latches on both sides. Now on the 2024 model starting January 1st, uh, it will come standard with a front and rear LP quick connect system. Uh, those can be used with any uh, appliance or device that, that's set up to run on a low pressure system with an RV. Now the front jack, same one we've used for several years. It's a Barker Manufacturing 3000 pound capacity jack. Uh, the front and rear jacks are pretty much the same, except the front has the, the cover on it. Uh, taking a look at the cover, you've got an up and down switch as well as a light. Uh, you just flip the light switch on or off and then you can operate the jack up or down. Now in operating the jack, as you press up, the camper goes up, so the jack is actually um, going down. When you go down, the camper goes down and the jack is actually retracting up. You do also have a bubble here on top of the jack. This bubble is so that you can level it. Uh, at times you may have to make an adjustment and if you have to adjust it, you'd have to get another level to sit inside the camper uh, to compare uh, and calibrate to this one. Uh, now, if this jack ever goes out, you can twist the top, pull it off and down inside, there is a way that you can use the manual jack crank to go ahead and crank this up or down as necessary. Located on the front corner of the street side, you'll notice you have a tire and loading information sticker. Uh, this does show you the size of the tires on the camper as well as the tire pressure. It'll also show you the max cargo weight rating of this particular camper. Uh, you'll also have a VIN sticker below that that will show you the date of manufacture. Uh, we'll also include the VIN and tire pressure as well. 
So we're gonna take a look underneath on the dr uh, driver's side. You'll notice the black tank flush port. Now the black tank flush port allows you to flush out your black tank. You'd simply hook up a water hose. That water would then travel through up around the tank in under the vanity uh, through a vacuum brake and a check valve and then back down and into the tank to flush it out. Uh, it is designed that way to make sure that no contamination can ever come back out into your hose. Let's go ahead and take a look at the power inlet. Um, now every camper comes with a power inlet on the driver's side. You may also get a convenience port uh, in one of the packages that also adds another 30 amp to the front of the camper. Uh, but this is the standard 30 amp connection here on the side. Uh, it is 30 amp, it is 120 volts. So if you ever decide to put in your own power, you'll want to make sure it is 30 amp, 120 volt power. All 2024 Legacy Elite 2 come standard with the uh, Dexter Never Lube axles uh, and 15 inch tires and wheels. Now those Never Lube axles means you never have to repack the bearings. Comes with a five year, 100,000 mile warranty from Dexter. Also comes standard with 12 inch braking. Uh, we also put the Dexter Easy Flex kit uh, on every camper, uh, which uh, gives you an equalizer in the center of the dual axles and eight grease zerks uh, so that you can grease the zerks instead of having to maintain uh, those bushings. Take a look inside the battery box. It does come with a compression latch that is lockable uh, to open. You'd pull it up and turn it one way or the other. Go ahead and let the door down. Now this gives us access to the battery tray. It has two latches, one on each side, and that will allow us to go ahead and pull the batteries completely out of the camper. This particular model has the three 130 amp hour batteries, which gives you a total 390 amp hour battery bank. Uh, you have a single positive and a single negative with jumpers between the batteries. Now with these lithiums, you do have an on and off button so that you can turn them off when not in use and back on as, as needed. Uh, now these do not have an internal heater, so it does have a heater mat underneath the batteries with a switch that you can control here on top. Now once you turn that switch on, it just tells the thermostat, hey, if it gets below 42 degrees, go ahead and kick the heat mat on. The only time you'd want to turn that on, of course, is if it's going to be cold temperature and you will be trying to charge the batteries. Once you're done, you just go ahead and close the tray, pull the latches in, make sure it's secure inside, and then close the battery box door, twist it back, and secure the latch. So let's take a look at our outside storage. Uh, this is what we call the basement. It does have a locking compression latch, just like the battery door. So you'll pull it up, turn it one way or the other to open it. Now, once inside, you'll see our storage located here. There is a light. You reach up and under, and there's a light switch. Now, inside this area, you'll uh, automatically get a power cord, a manual jack crank, and a lug wrench. Now over here to the left side, you'll notice that we have our rear jack switches, our outside shower, and our black and gray uh, blade valve pulls. Uh, of course, to dump the black tank, you would simply pull the lever. Once you pull the lever, it would allow uh, it to open up the tank uh, and dump everything through the waste system. Once you've done that, you would close it and then you would simply pull the valve for the gray and go ahead and release the gray uh, waste tank as well. Now here on the jacks, uh, one works for each side. You just simply press a down. That would bring the jacks up, press up, and that will deploy the jack down. The direction of the jack works based on the direction of the camper movement that you want. So up means you're moving the camper up, down means down. All right, uh, here in the external shower, you just open it up. You have the sprayer as well as a hot and cold water control. Uh, the little handle here, uh, which allows the water flow through the faucet. Now, once you're done utilizing this and you restore it back inside, you will definitely want to make sure that you turn these knobs to the off position. Uh, otherwise, you can get some mixing between the hot and cold side. Now, located uh, just to the side of the basement door, uh, we have a satellite and cable connection. Each one is labeled the top for satellite and should run directly inside to the rear attic access. The cable will go inside and actually be attached to a splitter 
uh, or if you get the Omni HD antenna, it will run to the back side of uh, that splitter. Located at the rear of the camper on the street side, we have our fresh water connection. Now this connection is so that you can hook up water and fill the onboard fresh tank. If you look over to the, to the corner here, it is labeled. And we wanna look at the hose uh, located below. That hose is a drain for the AC condensation. Here at the rear of the unit, uh, we do have the emergency exit window. Uh, we'll take a little bit closer look once we get inside on how that operates. Uh, below uh, the rear window, we have the spare tire cover. Now to access the spare tire cover, you will have to flip up uh, the license plate holder and go ahead and remove the nut and washer. Don't forget to, to pull the washer out. Now we just simply slide the cover off. We'll want to set it down so that we can disconnect the license plate light. Now, once we've done that, we can move the spare tire cover off to the side. All right, now we have access to the spare tire. We'll simply pull the... We'll pull it off of the camper and roll it around to the side. So when removing the tires, uh, if you're needing to lift it up, we do not uh, advise to use the onboard jacks. You would want to have a jack placed here at the jack point, which will be mounted here against the sub assembly. And there will be one located in the front and rear of the unit. So now we're gonna go ahead and remount the spare tire, uh, maybe the bad tire if you've had to replace the tire. You will want to run the wire for the uh, license plate light through it. Just pick any one of the holes to run it through and then go ahead and set the tire up on the bumper. Lift it up and onto the holder. And then we'll just secure it back to the camper. Before reinstalling the cover, we will want to go ahead and make the connection for the light. Hmm. Yeah. At this point, you may want to lift the license plate up so you can get a little better look to line the bolt and the hole up. Don't forget to, uh, to reinstall the washer first. And then you're ready to go. All right, we're gonna take a look at our rear bumper system. Now located behind the rear bumper is the waste connection. To open the bumper, you will need to push up a little bit. You're relieving pressure of the pin Go ahead and pull the pin out. There's one on each side. So on the other side, we'll go ahead, relieve the pressure, remove the other pin, and now we can drop the bumper down. Located here inside the rear bumper is our main waste connection. This is where you'd wanna connect your waste hose, and it is designed that you can then store the waste hose back here, uh, away from your other basement uh, accessories. You'll also notice over here on this side is the rear LP quick connect system. Again, this is standard as of January 1st, 2024. And then when you're done utilizing the bumper, you'd simply push it back up in place. Again, you'll need to make sure that you kind of hold the pressure of that weight of the bumper while you reinstall the pins. Located at the rear uh, curbside of the camper uh, is our main water connection. This is city water connection. So anytime you have uh, city water access, you would hook up here. In normal mode, this will deliver the water out to all the faucets and fixtures inside the camper. Now, outside of normal mode, we have other things you can do. If you don't have a city water uh, connection and you're boondocking or doing maintenance on the camper, um, we'll go over those water valves when we're inside. But this is the port you would utilize with the water pump. 
So with that feature, what you can do is if you're boondocking, you can actually pull from a five gallon water tank and deliver that water inside to your onboard fresh tank. Uh, you can also winterize the camper through this port. Uh, you would sanitize your fresh tank through this port. Uh, and you could also perform decalcification of the plumbing lines through this port. Now again, that is all through the water pump and we'll go through that uh, a little bit more once we're inside the camper. So located here on the curbside of the camper uh, is the Truma water heater. The Truma water heater uh, is an upgrade package. It's, it's just the Truma package, which will come with the Truma AC, Truma water heater. We'll go ahead and open the door to take a look behind. Um, now with the Truma water heater, it is an on-demand water heater. Uh, you have a power on off switch out here. Once it's powered on here, it is actually controlled from inside from the CP plus control unit. Uh, now this is the lever that will drain the small onboard tank uh, and it does have a pressure relief valve here as well if for some reason pressure ever reaches a point and it needs to drain some of that pressure off. Uh, to drain the water heater you'd simply pull this up and pull this lever down. Now this one has been winterized so it has no filter in it. During winterization we do not recommend ever leaving this in. Uh, if you do, it can trap just a small amount of water between these two uh, O-ring seals uh, and cause damage to the tank. Uh, but if we were just doing it, uh, once you pulled it out, this is where the filter goes. Remove it, and we usually, for winterization purposes, just stick it right there until it's needed. Next to the uh, Truma water heater is the Truma furnace. The Truma furnace is standard on all models, uh, controlled through the CP Plus control inside. Uh, this is just the outside vent area for it. Um, here is your outside outlet. It is tied to the same outlet circuit inside the camper and does run through a GFCI. Located next to our entry door is a great new feature. It is our outside table. Uh, you lift it up and locks in place. Um, it allows you to put drinks, uh, food, uh, condiments, uh, anything that you'd like to sit out here on the table. Once the party's over, you can simply reach underneath and go ahead and release it back down into storage mode. Let's take a look at uh, the entry steps. Uh, now these are made in-house out of the same aluminum as the frame. It's a two-step design. Uh, now to stow it, you would simply fold the bottom step up on top and then slide it into place. Now, uh, and of course to remove, you'd simply pull it out and fold the step down. All right, here at the entry door, we do have a grab handle uh, to the left of the door. Now this door has the RV lock, which is an upgrade. Um, you can electronically control the deadbolt uh, and then the same key will manage the handle and the deadbolt as well. Now to open the door, you'll open it up Entry door does have a hold open link to make sure it secures and holds the door open for you. Now, during a storm or high winds, you will want to, to disconnect this because the wind could blow it and pull it off. Uh, but uh, under a beautiful day, you might want to have the door open. Here inside the entry door is the screen. Uh, it is attached with a little hook, but you can disconnect, close the screen by itself or keep it attached to the main entry door. So what we want to look at first is the curbside awning. The curbside awning and the street side awning. So we're going to go ahead, push the switches to turn them on. Now I do want to show you with those on, you turn the master switch, the master switch does not control them. So make sure that uh, you turn them on and off as necessary. Now once we have the power turned on and the awnings receive power, we're going to take a look at the actual awning remote and how we operate and control those awnings. We're going to go ahead and take a look at the uh, awning remote. Uh, now if you have one awning, uh, you'll just have channel one. If you have two awnings, you'll have channel one and channel two that you can scroll through so that way you know which one you're operating. Curbside will always be channel one. Street side, which is the optional, will be channel two. So here, if we turn it on, uh, right now it is on channel one. We can switch it and it'll move to channel two. Now, right now we are located inside the camper so that we can see um, the LED screen on this as it is considered an inside remote. 
You can take it off the wall, take it outside with you. However, it's a little bit more difficult to see outside. So you may want to set it up uh, to which channel. Once you do, you can actually lock it, lock the remote, unlock the remote. All right, but uh, we're gonna go ahead and step outside and operate our curbside channel one awning so that you can see the LED light and how it operates in and out. Now what we're gonna do is go ahead and open the uh, curbside awning. Uh, with the remote, it's done kind of powered down, so I'm gonna hit the button to go ahead and bring it out of sleep mode. I'm gonna hit the out and go ahead and see the awning extending out. Now it'll extend out by itself and stop when it's supposed to. Uh, you don't have to allow it to go all the way out. I can actually hit the stop button and stop it right here. Um, go ahead and hit the out button again to allow it to keep on extending to its preset limit. Now, once that's uh, extending, I can go ahead and I can change to channel two, which is gonna be my street side awning. Now I'm gonna go ahead and hit the out button on it so that I can go ahead and start extending it as well. Um, can extend both at the same time. And I'm gonna go ahead and just let them run all the way out so that you can see the preset limit and how far out they go. All right, now both of our awnings are fully extended. You'll notice today it is a little windy here. Uh, this is okay. Uh, they are preset with a wind sensor, so if it gets a little too windy, it will pull it back in. I would tell you that anytime your awnings are out, you would want to stay close by the camper just in case a storm was to blow in uh, and catch these awnings before the wind sensor, you have a chance to bring them back. Um, if it does catch it and the wind sensor doesn't have the opportunity to bring it back in fast enough, it can damage the awning, uh, which is not covered under the awning warranty. Um, but once you're ready to bring it back in, you just simply select which awning it is that you want to do, hit the end button. It's going to immediately start retracting and bringing itself in. Uh, again, you can do both at the same time. I'll go ahead and select channel one as well, tell it to come in. Both are coming in. Now, both of these awnings do have an LED light strip on the end of them, uh, so you can turn lights on both. Again, you would just select the channel for which awning you're wanting to turn the LED light on. We're gonna take a look at our main panel, switch panel inside the camper. It's right inside the entry door. Uh, of course, top left is our master lights. Uh, it does control all the lights. It does not control your awnings, however. So we'll go ahead and turn that master light switch on. Uh, at this point, we can go ahead and turn our porch lights on. The porch lights are your high mounted lights on the exterior of the camper. Uh, the outside courtesy lights are the exterior uh, low lights uh, under the camper. And then of course we have our main cabin lights, our closet uh, and our cabinet. Um, now, uh, if we were ready to, to leave uh, the camper, uh, you see all the blue LEDs signifying that they are on. We can simply turn the master and now everything is off. Turn it back on. We also can turn on and send power to our awning and our rear camera in this camper. Uh, now you will see if we turn the master switch off, it does not cut power to the awning or the camera, only to our lights. Located right inside the entry door, we do have our closet door. Uh, this is where your fire extinguisher is located. Now to get inside the closet, it's got a compression latch. You just pull it open, twist. Once you open it, uh, you'll see the closet inside. You have two shelves and a hanging rod. Now, depending on the model of camper you get, you may also have a filler panel uh, attached to the wall inside that is for our king bed uh, called the standard model. Um, it's utilized with the table to make the rear bed. You'll also be able to see uh, the plumbing. Uh, some of the plumbing as it comes out of the bathroom and goes up through the roof for venting uh, is located inside this closet as well. Let's take a look uh, inside the bathroom. Uh, now to get into the bathroom, we do have our new shower door. Uh, it's completely different for the 2024 year models. Uh, we'll go ahead and open that door and take a look inside. All right, let's take a look inside the bathroom. Uh, now you do have a inside courtesy light mounted on the vanity. Uh, we also have a vanity insert Inside that insert, uh, there is a water pump switch. 
uh, that will operate the water pump in case you jump into the bathroom and forgot to turn the pump on. Uh, now on the countertop, we do have a faucet that doubles as the shower. You simply pull it out and place it in the wand holder on the wall. Uh, you do want to make sure you don't pull it past the wand holder. It's only designed to pull out at that length to the wand holder. Uh, and then you have above a head your um, max fan. The max fan, of course, you just raise it, open it uh, as you use it, and push the little button to turn it on, uh, vents uh, air out. Now let's take a look at the cabinet. The cabinet is in the Elite 2 model uh, for storage of anything you might want to keep in the bathroom. Now looking below the cabinet is our standard toilet. Uh, it comes with every camper. There is an upgrade option to a compost toilet. Now over on the side of the vanity, uh, you'll notice a waterproof toilet paper holder. And right below that toilet paper holder is a furnace duct. Uh, that does provide some heat into the bathroom. Now, if you take a look down to the side of the toilet, you'll notice another little duct that is actually used for return air. Uh, it just allows that heat build up as it uh, builds up inside the bathroom to return to the furnace. Now, if you look uh, down below um, next to the toilet, you'll also see a little handle. That handle is the backflow preventer. Uh, when you're traveling, it'll be pressed in. That closes the valve. And when you're in here utilizing the camper, in order for the sink to drain or the shower pan to drain, you will need to pull that out so that it is open. So let's take a look at our side dinette. Uh, of course, uh, above the dinette, you have two cabinets uh, for storage. Uh, below there, we have lighting. Uh, the light does have a switch directly on this light to turn it on and off and we have a reading light placed on each side. Uh, to operate the reading light, you just press in on the lens to turn it on and off. Now, uh, here we have our night and day shade. Right now, this is the day shade. You can slide that open, and then you can drop the night shade down as well. Now, behind the shade, of course, is the window. You can just open the latch, slide the window open. You can also slide the screen open on the side windows. Now, here at the side dinette, it also doubles and will slide down to make a, a side bed. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at how to place this dinette table down into bed mode. So the first thing we're gonna wanna do is to loosen the thumb screws located up and under the table into the table brackets. These are designed to kind of give it a little bit more stabilization so it doesn't rock from side to side. Now, once we have those loose, uh, we'll simply want to pull the table up and out of the bracket and off of the pole. We will need to go ahead and remove the pole. Now, it has a collar, locking collar at the, the lower base of it. You will need to make sure that it is loose. Once it's loose, you would just grab a hold of the pole, twist it, and pull it up and out of the floor base. Now you can stow that in your closet or anywhere else you'd like to store it. Now that we have the space open, we would simply take the table and lay it down in place and then move our cushions over into bed mode. Here located underneath the side dinette, we have our 120 volt breaker panel. To open it, you just press in on the door and then lift it up. On the inside here, you'll see the breakers for each circuit. Depending on the model you get, it may be set up slightly different, but it does have a label to let you know which um, each breaker is for. Now, to the side of the 120 volt panel, we have our 12 volt fuse panel. To open it, you just simply pull the cover off, which will show you the fuses for each circuit. And inside the, the door is the label for each circuit. All right, located on the other side of the side dinette, we have our LPCO alarm. And right above that, we have a USB charger. Now this USB charger does have an on off button located on the side, you do have to press that button to power it up. And then when it's not in use, you can turn it off and close the cover. 
Now on this USB, you will see that we have a standard USB B type and the new USB C type as well. Here on this side of the side dinette, you also have your GFCI circuit. Now all outlets run through this outlet except for the microwave and the refrigerator. Uh, the fridge and the microwave are on dedicated circuits, but all other outlets will run through this outlet. So if you ever have outlets that aren't working, you can check this press the reset button. Now, if you have no shore power coming into the unit, the reset button will not function at all. It does have to have power for it to reset. So here we're taking a look at our convection microwave. It is a, a upgrade from our standard. The standard is just a regular microwave. Of course, this one allows you to convect, uh, which would actually allow you to do some cooking in the microwave. Uh, other than that, it basically will work like any other microwave. You've got a button that opens and operates the door. One thing I would mention with this, whether you're preheating, using the microwave, doing anything to it, it will look for you to open and close the door. Uh, and that is a safety feature that is built into it because it's trying to make sure, hey, you have put something in here, or you are aware, is there food, not food. You cannot operate the microwave without anything inside it. You can preheat using the convection method. Now below the microwave, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the refrigerator. It is an ACDC style fridge. Uh, the handle is located on one side. You can open it. Inside you have, of course, ample storage uh, as well as a small freezer in the top left corner. Now to, to operate this refrigerator, there's a small dial located in the upper right corner uh, that you can turn it to zero, meaning off, uh, or turn it all the way up to seven to get the coldest output from it. So here at our kitchen galley area, we do have two cabinets above for storage. Uh, of course, you have the kitchen sink as well as a, a faucet that has a pull-out sprayer. We have a two-burner stove and plenty of drawers below for storage. Now, all of the drawers do have easy close. The top left is a short drawer, but it still has the easy close method. Uh, for final securement before travel, we do have a 10 pound push pull catch. You do have to press the drawer in to snap it in place. All right, here at the kitchen, we have two lights. They do have a switch on each light. So you just simply have to turn the light on and off directly at the light. Now to the right over here at the end of the galley, uh, we also have a reading light. It operates the same where you just press in and uh, to turn the lens on and off. Uh, next to that, we have a 12 volt port, charge port, and in the front, another USB charge port. Now, again, this does have a, a little power switch on the side where you do have to turn it on. Now, we do have a Dometic two burner cooktop. You just open it up and you have your two burners. Uh, we'll take a look at how to light and operate this as well. One thing I do want to mention as far as the top goes, you do not want to force it closed. It does kind of hold itself open. If you force it closed, you will break the hinges. So you need to pull up before you close it. I'm going to take a look at the cabinet above the microwave. Uh, towards the front of the camper, you have another service access point. This gets to the back side of the main switch plate and you'll have a single outlet here uh, for the microwave. Taking a little bit closer look inside the cabinet on the curb side, I want to pull the black uh, piece up. Now you'll notice on this side, there's another piece of white board in here. Uh, and that is to, for code purposes to go above the 120 volt wire that runs in this cabinet. Uh, we just have to make it a little more difficult to, to reach in here to, to, to grab a hold of that for safety purposes. Take a look at our pantry. Uh, of course, it has the same compression style latch. You just pull it, twist it, open the door. Uh, inside you have two shelves, quite a bit of space to, to store extra items. Now inside the pantry, we do have a service port. Uh, that service port, of course, is just to get to the back side of some of the panels for the Truma, the Sea level and the Xantrax. Below the pantry, uh, what we call the pantry countertop here, uh, it is removable. You can pull it up and open and you have a little bit extra storage there below the countertop. 
Below the pantry countertop, we do have a switch. This switch operates the inside courtesy lights. When you flip it on, it will light uh, the one up on the side of the dinette as well as one inside the bathroom. Here we have the Dometic thermostat. Now this is if you get the standard Dometic uh, air conditioner in the unit, uh, this thermostat will only control the air conditioner. Uh, you'd simply press to turn it on, scroll through the modes, you have a uh, fan mode. In auto, uh, it's gonna choose what it's going to do. You can also select low or high speeds as well. And once you've decided what uh, your fan mode is, you can go into the air conditioner and then at that point, set the, the temperature that you'd like it to cool to. Uh, now, if at any point uh, you don't like the fan speed mode that you're on, you would have to go back in to the fan speed uh, and adjust it. Once you've done that, go back into uh, the air conditioner and you're good to go. Now, you will notice that it does come up with furnace. However, it does not control and cannot control the furnace. So if you ever select furnace, the only thing that may happen is that your fan may continue to run if you've left the fan speed set to low or high. If you've left the fan speed set to auto mode, then the fan should automatically kick off when you're in this furnace as nothing is gonna be getting power, nothing's gonna be running. Uh, of course, then you can just, of course, scroll to the off. Now, in this model with the standard Dometic AC, the way to control the furnace is through the Truma uh, CP Plus thermostat. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. All right, here with the Truma CP Plus when controlling the furnace, when you have the standard Dometic air conditioner, you'll turn it on to wake it up. Uh, you'll go ahead and select the little caravan picture, uh, and then you'll turn the thermostat so whatever degree you want for your furnace. Once you select it, you will see a bottle showing you are running on LP power. A flame will start to flash as it lights and operates. And then of course, at this point, you could go in and adjust uh, from auto into night mode for the fan on the furnace. Uh, now this is the only option because it, it uh, once it's initialized, it recognizes that it does not have the Truma water heater and it does not have the Truma AC. So it's only gonna give you control to the furnace. Uh, some of the other things you'd still have access to, you could still set a start uh, and a stop time and tell it what you want uh, the temperature to come on and run and operate at uh, during that time period. Uh, you can tell it auto fan and on. It would go ahead and put the logo in the top right, letting you know that that is engaged. Now to turn it off, you'd simply go back into it, select off, the icon disappears. You can uh, go in and set the time uh, to whatever time you want. And then of course the settings. Offset is just an offset for the furnace. Basically once it reaches temperature, uh, you can tell it you do not want it to re-engage until there's at least a two uh, temperature differential. Uh, that way it's not shutting off just to turn immediately back on. Uh, the temperature can be changed from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Uh, the brightness can be controlled of the display. Uh, you can have a 12 hour uh, format for your clock or 24 hour format. Different languages are available. Uh, index shows the current software, and then you can do a complete reset of the unit back to factory settings. Now, if we've decided we no longer want this to be on, we just go back in, scroll all the way to the left until we see off, and now it is turned off. Here in the standard model, since we've got the standard suburban water heater, standard Dometic uh, air conditioner, um, this is the suburban water heater controls located directly above your radio. Uh, to turn that on, of course, make sure that it is full of water. Uh, make sure that you do have your LP tanks turned on. Now this switch here only controls the gas side uh, of this suburban water heater. It does require 12 volt power. Uh, to operate the, the controls for it. Uh, you turn that on, light's gonna come on. That light is gonna stay on uh, while it's heating the temperature. Once it reaches temperature, it's gonna go off. Uh, if it reached temperature and you turn it off, 
uh, and then just come back 10 to 15 minutes later and turn it right back on. This light may not come on because the burner is not required. Uh, it's gonna monitor the temperature between, uh, I believe the top end is around 185 degrees. Uh, once it reaches that temperature, it shuts off. It'll monitor it until it drops down to about 120 uh, and then it would re-engage the flame. When the flame is re-engaged, you would notice the red light. Red light is to let you know that the burner is on and it is heating. Located to the right of the pantry, uh, we have several options here. Uh, this has the Truma package, so it's got the Truma air conditioner, Truma furnace, and the Truma water heater, all controlled from the CP+. Uh, now you'll notice here we've got like a little caution sign. That's because uh, one of the devices is not turned on. We currently also don't have power in the camper, so we won't be able to actually run uh, the air conditioner in it uh, without shore power. What I'm gonna do is go ahead and I'm gonna turn our inverter on so we can get power. With this particular model, uh, we have a 3000 watt inverter that is able to run the air conditioning. So once we turn that on, it takes just a few seconds for it to supply power out to everything. You'll notice here it's still waiting. It hasn't given us any information just yet. All right. Now it's popped up showing our 13.1 uh, volts, the green light showing that we are on battery. Uh, this would light up if we were on shore power. Uh, so what I wanna do is go ahead, turn this on. You can adjust it, heater, air conditioner, or auto mode. Uh, once you select the one you want, you can turn it and set it to, uh, if you want it on cool, auto. Or if it's cold, we can turn the furnace on, turn it all the way up and then all the way back down. Now, once you do run it on furnace, you'll notice that a little flame comes in. You'll see a, a bottle pop up that's just letting you know you are using your propane. The flame will show once it starts to light and it's burning, it'll start to flash as well. Uh, and the fan is in auto high mode. Now, when it's in furnace, you can go over to the, the fan uh, and adjust it to auto or night. You can go in here, if we go back into the AC and turn it to AC mode for cool, then we can switch it back to fan and go from low, mid, high, and night mode. We scroll back to the little picture of the RV. We're gonna go ahead and turn this back to off. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this uh, here is for the hot water heater. You can go into the hot water heater, turn it to eco. Eco mode uh, will keep the temperature inside the small tank at 42 degrees. Uh, it won't let it get to a temperature that where it'll freeze. Uh, so that would be the uh, mode uh, if you're just wanting it to, to be available, uh, but not uh, use too much of the propane. You also have comfort. It will maintain that tank at around 102 degrees. Uh, so it's much warmer. It'll deliver that hot water a little bit faster, but we're talking seconds. Mm. Now, uh, this here is a timer. You can set it to where uh, uh, something kicks on automatically. This is AM 430. And then uh, what time you want it to go off. Uh, you can tell it AC, auto, or heater. Um, so that way it, it comes on to a specific temperature and you can just tell it, I want it to come on and be at least 70 degrees and use either AC or heat in order to reach that. Uh, you can also tell it you want it to automatically turn your hot water heater on. Uh, you can adjust the temperature down if you don't like the preset 120 and then you tell it, yes, turn it on. Now you'll notice the timer is up here as well, letting you know it is on and it would run that every morning until you turn it off. If we want to turn it off, we'd simply, while this is flashing, go back into it, turn it off. The little logo is no longer there. Now, if you ever see the caution light, you can click it. It'll tell you what uh, the, the code is. W means warning, E would mean error. 255 is the code and W means water heater. Um, if it's the furnace, it'll have H for heater. Um, but this is because the water heater is not turned on outside at the main power switch. Mm -hmm. This is to set the clock um, at, at whatever time it is where you're at. 
and then you can go into settings. Uh, offset is for the furnace. You can set the offset at whatever you want for the furnace uh, so it's not constantly cycling. Uh, you also have an AC set that you can set up. Uh, ACC you would want on in order to utilize the AC set parameters. Uh, you can go into the AquaGo um, settings. And this is just uh, some of the different options that you have. You can set your temperature from Fahrenheit or Celsius. Brightness of the screen. Uh, you can choose to set it up for a 12 hour clock format or a 24, whichever you prefer. Different languages, index, and then a complete reset uh, of the thermostat back to factory settings. You will notice a little plug there. Uh, the plug is indicating that it is receiving 120 volt power. Uh, again, we're not plugged in, but we have the inverter on. So as far as it's concerned, it is getting 120 volt power uh, and will allow the AC to run. That is an optional uh, thing with the 3000 watt uh, inverter. Now let's go ahead and take a look below that. You've got your sea level two tank monitor. It shows your uh, battery voltage. Now, with the battery voltage, it's going to show you either what the battery voltage is or what the charge voltage going into the battery is. When you're hooked to shore power and charging, uh, it may show you the charge voltage. Uh, if you immediately unhook from shore power, it's typically going to be less. Uh, if you ever see 14.4 volts or higher, that is a charge voltage, not a battery voltage. Now, to look at what you have in the fresh tank, uh, press the fresh button. It'll come up and display the percentage uh, and go back out. If you need to see it for a little bit longer, you can press this button twice. You'll notice a little dot, and that way it'll leave that display up there. That way, if you're filling your fresh tank, you can come in here and monitor it. Once it gets close to full, you can go back out and turn the water off. Press the button, it goes back out. Same thing for the gray and then same thing for the black tank if you're needing to monitor those. Now this is the primary water pump switch here. Uh, turn it on here. You can also turn it on in the bathroom as well at the vanity. Below the sea level monitor you have your uh, inverter control. Uh, this does allow you to see information. Uh, currently showing 13.1 volts in the batteries. We don't have any load because we don't have anything turned on uh, at the moment. It is showing that batteries are providing the power. Uh, again, the battery uh, picture here with the green light shows that we are running through the batteries. Uh, that is controlled with this button. On off switch, uh, you can turn that off and everything should shut off. Uh, we'll lose that 120 volt power out to our appliances that run through the inverter. Not everything does run through the inverter. Uh, your refrigerator does not run through the inverter. It is an AC-DC fridge, dedicated circuit, and only runs either through shore power for the AC side, or it will run through the DC side off the batteries, and that's because it is more efficient that way. You lose efficiency running it through the inverter. Same thing um, with the microwave. It is on its own dedicated circuit. However, it is attached to the inverter, uh, so that way uh, you can run it through the inverter uh, when you don't have shore power uh, available. Uh, the other thing on the inverter is going to be the rest of the outlets in the camper uh, and your air conditioner if you've gotten a 3000 watt inverter. If you've gotten a 2000 watt in inverter or no inverter, um, your air conditioner will not be on the inverter side and will only work on shore power. Tron Energy Battery Monitor. Uh, it does show you the voltage. You can scroll through, see how many uh, amps is currently loaded on the system, uh, the watts, the amp hours, uh, and the state of charge on the batteries. Uh, this should closely match what you have on your battery app uh, that you can monitor directly at the battery app as well. Uh, this does have Bluetooth, so you can connect to this via your phone as well. Uh, we'll look at that a little bit later uh, when we also take a look at the solar charge controller uh, that you will Bluetooth and use an app to control. We'll go into the Victron Connect app. Now once we go into the Victron Connect, it's going to show me uh, all of the Bluetooth uh, Victron available. Uh, of course, now I'm here on site with quite a few campers that have it, so it's showing me several. Uh, now the Smart BMV is the battery monitor. Of course, you can see the picture to the left. If you'll click on that, it'll log into it. Six zeros is the default pin code. 
This particular one is out of date, so we would need to update it. Uh, you'll simply click the update button, run it through until it finishes its update. Again, note the six uh, zeros. Um, I didn't have to enter it because I'm already connected to it. Now, uh, it's telling me that it's unsecured access to change the pin code. I'm not gonna change the pin code now because I'm gonna wait until whoever buys this camper can change it to what they want it to. Not now. So it's showing me 100% state of charge on the batteries. Uh, now it's popped up and it's asking me for an instant readout. Um, I do like that feature. Uh, you can see here in the center where it shows a little bit more information underneath. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and say enable now. Uh, we'll go back in a moment and take a look to see what that shows. Uh, but here on the main screen, 100% state of charge shows my voltage of 13.61 volts. Uh, the current draw that I have, uh, that can either be negative if you're drawing or it can be a positive uh, if you're charging. Uh, at 13.61 volts, we're probably in a float state of charge on the batteries. Now, the consumed amp hour shows how much we've uh, consumed during this uh, last time period. Uh, time remaining doesn't show anything because we're currently connected to a shore power. We can go into the history and see some more information as well as trends. Now, let's go ahead and go back out. Now, we're going to go ahead and log into the solar charge controller. It's the Smart Solar MPPT. Now, while we're on this screen, you can see some of the ones I've already uh, enabled the smart readout uh, where it shows the voltage, the watts, and uh, information underneath. Now, let's go ahead and go into the solar charge controller. Again, six zeros is the default pin code. Uh, and again, this one is out of date, so we'll need to go ahead and update it. Once the update is complete, go ahead and click the continue button. It will send us back to the main screen. We'll go ahead and click back into the charge controller. All right. And since I'm already uh, connected to this one, I did not have to, to enter the six uh, zeros. I'm again not going to change the pin at this time. But now this is showing us information. Uh, you have Solar voltage information, this, uh, this is from the panels and you've got batteries, that is from the batteries. You also show the current at both uh, the panels and the batteries as well. Uh, and again, you can go into the history, you can go into the trends to see more information. Now, as far as the settings for either one of these, they should already be set up uh, by us here uh, at the plant or at the dealership. Uh, if for some reason you have questions, you can give us a call. Now below the battery monitor, we have Furion radio. Uh, it works similar to any other radio. You've got your power button. Right now it's off with the red light. The red light does stay on when it is off. Press the button, it changes to kind of a blue color. Uh, you've got your volume here uh, and your zones. We only use zone one and two. Uh, if you press these and turn them off, the speakers are cut off. And at that point, it does not matter what the volume is turned to. Uh, so make sure zones one and two are on. Uh, some of the other uh, things we have uh, that you'll wanna know, of course you can Bluetooth to it. Uh, it does have different ports that you can connect and select. Uh, one of the primary things that we use is the ART channel. Uh, you can scroll through until you get to ARC. On ARC, that's going to allow you to get sound from the TV through to the radio. Uh, that, uh, that way, if you're watching TV, uh, either through the optional Omni HD antenna or, or, a, or you've connected to your smart TV another way, you can run through the ARC, play it through the radio speakers. Located on the ceiling, kind of in between the kitchen and the pantry is the Max Air fan. Uh, this is the fan you'll want to operate uh, and run while you're cooking with the LP stove. Uh, it does have a manual feature here to open and close it. Uh, you can use that if the power is not working. 
You can also use this once you've turned the fan on if you want to close the hood and use it more for like a ceiling fan that will simply help recirculate air inside. However, when you are running the stove, you will need to make sure you are venting out so that every, uh, it is pulling that, that gas fume out of the camper. Now you have controls located here on the max fan. Uh, there's also a remote control, uh, but we'll operate them here. You press the power button, it will automatically open. Uh, it will start to blow according to how you left it. It can pull air in or it can vent out. Um, you can also adjust the speed directly here with a plus and minus. And then uh, it has a button to change from venting in to venting out. Hmm. Uh, those are pretty much the uh, controls that are located directly here on the Max fan. Uh, of course, you can press the power button again, turn it off. It'll go ahead and close everything. We can take a look at the actual Max Air Fan remote. Let's take a look at the Max Air Fan remote. Uh, now, the display on ours is uh, already awake. If it's not, you'd have to press the power button, wake it up. Uh, once you have the information displayed on the screen, you'll press it again, and it'll go ahead and turn the fan on to where you left it when you turned it off. Uh, so here it's showing that we are venting air out. This button controls that and you can pull air in or air out according to what you're doing. Uh, you also have plus and minus buttons. The plus and minus controls the set temperature. Uh, you can set the temperature here on this uh, and set it to auto. Uh, at that point, it'll determine what it needs to do to vent air in, vent air out accordingly. Of course, it is not a heater. Uh, or an air conditioner, uh, it's only going to try to control it based on uh, the temperatures uh, inside and outside. Uh, now, we'll turn it back on to regular air. Uh, to do the speed, uh, you'll control the fan buttons here. Uh, up controls the speed up, and of course down uh, to, to down. Now, you can close the lid. And you'll notice here it says ceiling fan, so it's placed it in ceiling fan mode. Ceiling fan mode is only to recirculate air that's already inside the camper. Uh, and then, of course, when you're ready to turn it off, just simply press the off button. Now, the display will go to sleep by itself, so at this point, you can place it away uh, inside a drawer or wherever you want to store it. All right, located uh, on the ceiling of the camper is the Truma air box. Uh, the air conditioner outside is going to dump the air down into here. Uh, and then where that air goes depends on how you control all these adjustments. Uh, you have several adjustments. You can turn this and the little flappers control. At this point, it's kind of blowing more down. Or I can open it up uh, to where it'll force more of the air forward. Uh, you can turn these little things as well, uh, which will blow it uh, either this direction or that direction depending on how you've got them turned. Uh, now this one, typically I would tell you to leave it in the center. Uh, this control is on the inside uh, and it basically controls once the air drops down, uh, how much air comes to this front vent and how much comes to the rear. Uh, if you do control it, I would tell you to push more towards the front than the rear uh, so it moves it towards the, the front of the cabin. Uh, the back control works the same way as the front. Let's take a look at our king bed setup. Now currently it's in our dinette. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and remove the dinette table. Once we have the table removed, we will need to remove the two floor posts. You're gonna reach down to the bottom collar, unscrew it. Once we have uh, the poles removed and out of the way, we will need to retrieve the filler panel located inside the closet. Now the filler panel for the Elite 2 will need to be located in the rear. Let's go ahead and place that. Once that filler panel is in place, uh, now we can go ahead and drop the table down as well to create our bed. Now once we have the table and the filler panel in place, all we need to do is put the cushions down and then you can make the bed.
Here on the street side above the bed area uh, cabinet, we're going to take a look inside this one so that we can see the solar cutoff switch. It is located just inside. It's this red switch. Of course, you'd want it on when you want your solar to be feeding your batteries. Uh, if for any reason you need to service the system or you were putting it away, uh, you could turn it off here at this point. The cabinet located to the rear right above the TV, what we like to call the attic. Uh, has same compression latch to open, but inside this cabinet at the rear, uh, there will be quite a few things you'll want to, to keep in mind. Now on the right side of the attic is our surge protector display. This just displays information when you are connected to 30 amp shore power or, or a 30 amp generator connection. It'll be showing the uh, incoming power as far as the voltage, the amperage, and it will, what you'll be looking for is an E0. E0 means no errors. If something else is displaying, um, then you're, you're having either a voltage issue coming into the camper or an intermittent uh, type issue. Uh, on this wall, we have the switch plate for the Omni HD antenna. This is optional. Uh, you simply press the button, the green light tells you that the power is on, uh, and that's all you have to do here at the switch plate. Uh, the next thing you'd want to do is go to the TV and run a channel search. Um, you can leave this on if you choose to, or you can turn it on and off as needed. Uh, of course, 120 volt uh, power here. This is the TV connection. Uh, it is a 120 volt smart TV, uh, so you will have to have a uh, shore connection uh, or actually have the inverter turned on for the TV to operate. You do have a 12 volt port for an accessory if you choose to have one here. Uh, and we leave one HDMI cable that's already connected to the TV here in this attic. If you want to add something uh, like a Blu-ray player uh, or some other uh, appliance or device that would connect to the TV. We're going to go ahead and turn the TV on so we can take a little closer look. All right. When it first comes on, now right now, the input that the TV is set to is for HDMI. Since we don't have anything playing through that input, it's not going to play anything. At the top left uh, corner of the remote is the actual input button. You can press that and that will scroll you through all of the different options. Now, SmartCast is the Smart TV feature of the TV. Uh, so again, if you have the cradle point option with Wi-Fi, you'd be able to utilize it, connect the TV to the cradle point, uh, and watch any of your favorite TV shows, movies, or whatever. Now right now, of course, it's showing no network detected because we don't have the cradle point uh, turned on uh, or set up inside the building here. Uh, again, we could press uh, input and we can uh, scroll through some of the different uh, inputs of the TV. So one thing I did want to show, now right now I've selected HDMI 1. So if I turn my Omni antenna on uh, outside and I was wanting to, to scan for TV channels, I hit the settings button and I noticed that TV channels is grayed out. That's because HDMI 1 input is not a TV channels supported uh, source. HDMI is going to go from the TV to the radio or to the accessory you add in the attic. So therefore, it's not gonna let me try to scan for TV channels as that's not an option on that input source. So you'd have to go through the input source to find the one that you use for that. So on this one, uh, and, and this may change sometimes. So right now it says no signal TV. But if you notice, if I go back to input, it says cable. And that's because the last thing utilized through this TV was cable. So therefore it's locked to cable instead of saying TV. If the last thing I used was TV, it would say TV. So once we've got cable or TV selected, you go in, you're gonna hit the settings, uh, which is a symbol of a little gear on the TV remote. Once you do that, you do have TV channels as you can see now. You select that and you'd simply hit find channels. Uh, or you can hit find new channels if you wanna perform a new channel search. Now we're currently located in an area where we will not get any TV channels. Uh, however, I'm gonna go ahead and perform so you can see what it looks like. And sometimes it does take five, six minutes for this to run through an entire scan. So if it's taking a little bit of time while you're sitting here watching it, 
it does take time. And like I said, uh, where we're currently located, I knew we wouldn't find any channels, but I wanted to go through the process just so that you would uh, know what to expect when you search for channels. Now at this point, of course, uh, there's other settings and things that you can go into. Uh, we're not gonna go into any of that right now. Most of that is just picture audio network type stuff, just like any other TV. All right, located at the rear is our smoke and CO alarm here. Uh, it, works and operates just like any one that you would have at your house. Now behind it in the rear corner, we have another USB port. In this USB port, it also has a power switch that you have to turn on in order for it to operate. So under the front dinette seat, uh, you'll see the black tank blade valve and cable, and to the side of that will be the backflow preventer uh, valve and cable as well. Uh, now the black tank blade valve is located in three inch drain pipe coming out of the black tank, while the backflow preventer is located on a one and a half inch pipe that is tied to your bath um, sink and shower pan, and then that flows into the gray tank. You'll also notice the white piping there on the side of the black tank. That is for your black tank flush port. Uh, when you hook to that port on the outside, it comes in, actually goes around behind the black tank, up and under the bath vanity, uh, and then it comes back down and returns to the side of the tank itself. Now, you'll also see located uh, right in front of the tank uh, a bolt. Um, that bolt is one of the bolts that secure the lower body to the frame. All right, now let's go ahead and take the cover off of this dinette seat so we can take a look underneath. Now on this particular model, we do have a transfer relay. Uh, that transfer relay is set up because we have two power inlets on here. Uh, as the shore power is connected, it would just simply click in order to select which is the incoming power. Once that power comes in, it will go through the onboard uh, surge protector. Once the surge protector determines that the power is good, everything is okay, it will then send that power into your breaker panel so here is the transfer relay, here is the surge protector, and then up and under here is the breaker panel. Now you'll notice the bar uh, with the yellow wires connected, that is the main ground system, and the main ground is just to the right of that. Um, now one piece you'll have here is a relay, that relay is for the water pump system. All right, under this uh, same dinette section, up and underneath, uh, mounted on the side of the battery box, you will notice that we do have a shunt. Uh, that is an optional thing uh, in this particular model. And then you'll also have a negative bus bar. Uh, all of the main battery cables that would otherwise go out to the batteries are located on this negative bus bar that then allows us to take a single cable out to the negative side of the battery. So inside this access panel, you will see that you have access to the rear jack. Uh, hopefully you never have to get in here to manually crank it, uh, but that is what the top post here is for. You will have a manual jack crank that comes with the camper uh, so that you can manually crank it up and down if ever needed. You'll also notice uh, the blue uh, solar charge controller located on the side of the wheel well. Uh, that is not a standard feature, it is an optional with some of the packages. Uh, it comes with the solar uh, that would charge the batteries when you're boondocking. Um, now, you'll notice directly across from the solar charge uh, controller is our inverter charger. It is mounted on the inside section of the wall. Uh, and that of course is connected to your batteries that will invert the battery into 120 volt power. Uh, now what that power supplies depends on the camper that you get. Uh, it may only supply power out to your receptacles and your microwave. And then there are also packages where it will also power the air conditioner. Of course that power is limited based on the, the battery bank that you have and how long it can actually run everything before the batteries have to be recharged. So let's take a look at some of the fuses and breakers located under here. Uh, you will have an auto resettable breaker uh, first for the solar. Uh, because it is auto resettable, you should never have to, to worry with it. If something happens and it trips, it will reset itself. 
To the right of that is a manual disconnect that is for the inverter. Typically, it's always going to be in the on position, but if for some reason you do need to disconnect that power uh, between the inverter and the batteries, you can turn it off uh, to make something serviceable uh, or for testing. To the right of that, you'll notice another manual breaker with a little red button you can push to trip. Uh, that is a 60 amp breaker, and that is what we call the battery's main breaker. Uh, so the battery system will come into that, and that will run out to power uh, the fuse panel system. To the right of that, you'll have another auto resettable breaker. Now that auto resettable breaker is dedicated to the safety breakaway for the trailer brakes in case of an emergency separation from the tow vehicle. And to the right of that, which we do not have in this particular uh, unit, you may also have a 12 volt charge wire connection. Now that 12 volt charge wire connection is only uh, connected when you have AGM batteries or standard 12 volt type batteries. Uh, with lithium batteries, you can't have that in here. Uh, it would actually have to go through a specialized uh, DC to DC charger. So up and under, uh, attached to the side of the battery box is the positive bus bar. Um, this is where all of the wires are going to mainly hit before a single wire goes out to the battery. Uh, so from this bus bar, you will see a few fuses. You're going to have your LPCO alarm fuse, uh, inline fuse connected there. If you have a compost toilet, it will be located there. And your jack fuses will also be coming off of there. The jack fuses are in the yellow capsules. Uh, the compost toilet will be in a little white style capsule. And then of course your LPCO alarm is your uh, square blade style fuse. So slightly to the left of the positive bus bar, you'll also notice a 300 amp ANL fuse. This is the fuse for the main system coming into the bus bar from the batteries. Right. Also located under this access panel is your gray tank blade valve. Now it is turned on its side and laying down on the lower uh, bottom of the shell. Uh, and then the cable just turns and goes directly out the side of the camper from here. So under the same access panel uh, is access to the back side of your outside shower. And below that is the back side of your blade valve pulls for your black and your gray tank. Now we're gonna fold the bed towards the front of the camper on the same street side. We have one other access panel here. Uh, this just gets to that exterior basement section in case you needed to get something while you were inside the camper. We're gonna go ahead and take a look under the curbside bed access panels. Now the rear most panel is gonna give you access to the furnace, the water heater, uh, and a specific valve for the water plumbing system. Uh, but let's go ahead and take a look down inside the cavity. So under this access panel on the left, you'll notice the Truma furnace. The Truma furnace is standard on all models. Uh, and we'll take a little bit uh, closer look at some of the ducting a little later. Just wanted to show you the location of the furnace. Now, as far as operation goes, all operation will go through the CP Plus. Uh, that way you can control the, the heat from there. Now to the right of that furnace is the Truma AquaGo on-demand hot water heater. It is currently an optional upgrade. If you upgrade to it, that gets you the Truma water heater and the Truma air conditioner add-on. Now behind the Truma hot water heater, you'll notice some connections. Uh, one I definitely wanna focus on is towards the bottom. Uh, on the blue line, it's a brass three-way valve. What that valve is, is the bypass valve. Right now it is set up where any incoming cold water would enter to the lower section of that hot water heater. And then of course, as it's on and running, the hot water heater will come out the top uh, port of the water heater. If we were to turn the bypass valve uh, towards the rear of the camper, it's going to divert that cold water up the bypass hose and straight down the hot water line. Uh, the reason we would do that is when we are winterizing or decalcifying uh, or doing anything with the system, uh, running some kind of chemical or cleaner through, or just winterizing the camper where we don't want water in our hot water heater, we would cut it off at that point and that would stop the flow of anything going into the water heater. Now, I wanna take a look uh, down to the right towards the bottom of the shell. Uh, there is a valve under there. Uh, it's a silver valve and I do wanna point that out. That valve is connected to the rear city water inlet. 
Uh, as right now it's in the open position. So when you hook the CD water in, it automatically allows the water to flow through that connection and out to everywhere it needs to go. The only time that that valve would need to be turned is when you are using the water pump to pull from that rear inlet. Again, it's only when you are pulling something from the rear inlet via the water pump. If it's normal operation where you have water in your fresh tank, it has nothing to do with that. Your water pump's normal configuration will pull from the tank and deliver straight out to the faucets. However, when we want to hook something to the rear inlet for winterization, sanitization, decalcification, uh, anything where we're wanting to put water from that rear inlet and pull it inside the camper from the water pump, we would have to turn that valve to the off position uh, so that the water pump is only pulling from the rear inlet. So let's go ahead and take a look at the rest of the valves that work with the water pump. So under the front access panel on the curb side, if you lift it up and look underneath the panel, you will see a little cheat sheet here showing you normal valve configuration, fresh tank feel, uh, and winterization decalcification. Um, it is noting that rear valve we were just speaking about, showing that normal, it is open, and the other two, it is in the closed but let's go ahead and take a closer look at the pump valves. So here we have the water pump. To the left of that is the water pump filter. Uh, you will need to take this off, clean it out ever so often. Uh, of course, this is the accumulator. Uh, it does come with air in it. Uh, it is preset from the factory. However, at some point it may need to be checked. Um, you do see the valves here. I will show this valve here uh, is allowing the pump to pull from the onboard fresh tank. It's in the open position, so if the water pump is turned on, it will automatically start to pull from here. This valve controls the water pump pull from that rear port. So in order to pull from the rear port, you would have to close this and open this one. The other two valves over here are delivery uh, ports. So this is open, so it is pulling the water through the water pump and accumulator system and sending it out to all the faucets and fixtures in the camper. This valve here, if it's opened up, will actually allow water to flow into the freshwater tank. So if you were wanting to sanitize the fresh tank or say refill the fresh tank uh, while boondocking from a five gallon water jug, you would need to close this and open this in order for the pump to pull from the rear port. And then you would simply close this off and open this, which would allow that water to dump back into the tank. Now, let's take a closer look down below. There are two other valves we wanna take a look at. Here underneath uh, the furnace ducting, uh, there is a valve that is open. That valve is used for testing purposes only. Uh, so you will always wanna make sure that that valve is left in the open state. Otherwise, it will cut off all flow into the fresh tank and it will not fill for you. Located at the very bottom is the fresh tank drain valve. Right now it is in the closed position, of course, because we wanna maintain the water in our tank. Uh, but when we're ready to, to drain it out, especially if we're putting it away for storage, uh, we never wanna leave water in the tank. Uh, that water may become stagnant uh, and, and grow algae. So you do always wanna make sure that you're draining it when it's not in use. Uh, you would open it and it is a slow drain process. It's draining out a half inch pipe um, it was designed that way, so when you get ready to, to be done, you can open it up and then travel if you need to travel because it is fresh water, so you can dump it. Um, but it will take a long time depending on how much water you have in the tank. Now, you'll also see the other side rear jack here as well. Uh, it's set up the same as the street side. You do have the crank on top. You would attach your manual crank handle uh, if the jack ever stopped operating. Coming out of the back of the furnace, you'll notice the ducting comes in. Here we hit a Y and we go ahead and have one outlet here in the, the bed area. Uh, then it connects and co continues under the galley. Uh, it will have one output uh, at the galley itself. And then of course be connected to run on into the bathroom for the final output duct. We're going to take a look at hooking up to the tow vehicle. So once you have the tow vehicle moved into place, we're going to go ahead and lower the camper down onto the ball. Once you have the camper on top of the ball, uh, there's two ways you can do it. You can simply go ahead and push the latch closed 
and use the foot method to go ahead and close it. Uh, if you don't want to kick your coupler, you can use your hand. Be careful because you can smash your finger here if it gets in the way, but you can press it in and go ahead and release the collar into place. Once you have it uh, coupled, then you can go ahead and hook your safety chains. Uh, it is recommended to crisscross these chains. Don't forget to hook up the safety breakaway. Safety breakaways should be connected directly to the tow vehicle, not to the safety chains. Now we'll wanna connect the seven pin. And then don't forget to put the safety pin on the coupler. I like to go ahead and put the cable through here as well to make sure it's good and secure. Once you have the front of the camper connected to the tow vehicle, just make sure that you have already raised the rear jacks and you're good to go. We're gonna take a look at disconnecting from the tow vehicle. So the first thing we'll want to do is disconnect our seven pin, the safety breakaway, and our two safety chains. We'll go ahead and lower the front jack before I disconnect from the coupler. What I wanna do is just let the jack hit the ground, take a little bit of the pressure off. Now that I've got the front jack on the ground, I'm gonna go ahead, remove the pin and open the coupler. And now I can go ahead and lift the camper off of the tow vehicle. Thank you for watching. For more information, please visit our website at olivertraveltrailers.com.